Hi, guys. Here we are again talking about coaching. And I'm here with Sevash and Yannick. Hi, guys. Hello. Hey. Hey. So today, guys, we're going to talk, or our question is, can I coach around grief and loss? Or is that better left to a therapist? Yeah, really interesting question, actually. Um, We just uh, recorded another podcast talking about um, <clears throat> dual relationships. And actually, the note we left off on, I was quite puzzling as we went into this now next episode. And I was just kind of thinking, actually, from um, about a therapist's perspective compared to a coach's perspective. So, yeah, I'm really curious to see what comes out in this question. <clears throat> yeah, I think this uh, this keeps popping up. And it keeps popping up more and more, I find. I remember many years ago, like must be five, six years ago, um, I was in a coaching community and somebody had shared that they're a, a bereavement coach for parents who lost young children. And I thought, no, 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 please, please don't. Like they need to work with a therapist um, was my immediate response. Um, please don't work with people without having proper training, withholding space for people who are grieving. They have, they need, then that coaching is not the right thing, you know? And then I wrote about it in one of my nuggets and I had a handful of uh, grief and loss coaches reach out and, and had some really interesting conversations. And I kind of uh, evolved my, my stance on it because I, I do think there's a, um, there's a place for coaching when people are grieving, when people lost a loved one or lost something that they've lo loved, right? Uh, recently, I talked to Julia Minol, who uh, wrote the, the book, I think there's only one, for coaching uh, and supervision in the context of grief and loss. And uh, I had a really good conversation on Coaching Uncaged by Animas um, around what is coaching in that in that context. And at what point might we need to refer? But everybody's grieving differently. Um, and when I, I've met, Julia said, for example, on the podcast, and I've, I've met a client recently who was quite similar in that respect. She said people kept telling her that she's she should be grieving more. She should be more sad. You know, they got concerned that she's not like crying all the time. Uh, and I think everybody grieves in their own way. Some people are more resilient. Some people have already kind of made peace with the idea that uh, that people die. Um, other people, it hits them in the face. They've been suppressing and denying that that's a fact in life, is that everybody dies. And so there's very different relationships with endings. As an existentialist, you know, we're always curious about people's relationship with endings. And endings are not just bereavement and grief around people dying somebody might have lost the job of their lifetime or an opportunity that they can't quite let go or a romantic relationship that has ended suddenly. Um, maybe they got divorced or maybe they lost an object that they were very, very attached to. Maybe a house that they wanted to buy, their dream house, it fell through. And so there's something around loss um, that affects people deeply. And depending on where people are, how resourceful they are, how affected they are by this loss, um, I think there's a place for coaching. And for some loss, for some grief, the emotions are just so high, they're so intense that coaching is no longer possible because you know, depending on how, what, your, what your perspective on coaching is, if it's about moving forward, which most coaches, not all coaches, but most coaches, there's, a, there's an element of moving forward. And Initially, when I thought about grief and loss and bereavement particularly, I thought for probably the majority of people who are bereaved, they just need to process that. That You could argue that that's part of moving forward, but like for when somebody is clinically depressed, you know, at the clinical end of depression, there's just, it's, no, it's not possible right now to form a positive thought moving forward. So coaching in that perspective is not possible. You know, so it's the wrong thing to engage somebody on. And it can actually make it a lot worse when the coach gives you the impression that I should be moving on. I should be progressing. I should be growing. There's post-traumatic growth, right? I should be learning from this and make sense of this and have a better life afterwards. 
it's not always the case. And if there is an a sense of that's expected and I'm doing it wrong and I'm not moving forward enough, I think that can be extremely detrimental and can make somebody's bereavement experience a lot worse. So in that case, please, please, please don't coach anyone if they're in that state and if that's your style of coaching. But there's many places, many contexts in which coaching can be the right kind of uh, approach and it can really help somebody make sense of an ending, even if it's high with emotions. Some coaches are so good at holding space for people, you know, and in those moments, it's not different to therapy, holding space, loving someone, holding space for where they can think and process and feel things, you know. So I'll pause there. I talked a lot, I feel. Um, what do you think? Well, what I think is, you know, we, we, we will lose a lot of people that call themselves coaches because what a lot of them are being taught, and that's what I was taught when I started, is you only need to, if you've gone through something and you can tell people the five steps on how you've gone through that, you can coach them. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, I, and I think, unfortunately, a lot of times this is how people are sold into the coaching dream of like, okay, you know what, you can build a career, you've gone, you know, I've, I've heard the craziest things like, oh, you've been abused, okay, now you can help people that have gone through that, you know, and you've you've lost people. And this is very common, and I think where, the, where it really makes a difference is when someone says, okay, you know what, I really want to do this, now I'm going to, and I've seen coaches that then the training and training in therapy and training in specifically they specialize in that area right well how do i hold space here what are things i really need to know right what is really important and they go really deep into it and this and i think that's the and unfortunately i think you know i, I mean i'm making this number up but i think it's probably quite accurate it's like 70 80 percent of these coaches they don't do that mm-hmm. especially not in the first one year or two year and this is not just specific to grief and loss, but I've seen this around people that, you know, have gone through sexual abuse, people that have gone through loss, grief. There's that they start doing this work without really even a lot of coaching experience, let alone be therapy experience or special specializing in that subject area. Because a lot of times this dream is sold around you just need to be one step ahead. Right? So, you know, just come up, just write down five steps on how you went from being lost to like where you are now and, and teach that to someone and you can call yourself, you know, the grief coach. Yeah, I went through a divorce so I can coach you through your divorce when actually my divorce and your divorce yeah. would have been completely different experiences or at least somewhat different experiences. You know, and mm. if that's your style of coaching, I'm not necessarily knocking it, right? Because there's something in the connection that is immediately there when someone had a very similar experience to yours. You know, you're immediately going to trust them more in some strange way, you know, because there are many parallels to the experience of loss or grief or divorce or whatever ending there is. And so being with someone who makes you feel like they understand that that has a big effect on someone. I'm not alone in this. You know, and if you pick your clients very carefully, if they're very similar to you, if they have similar values, similar beliefs, similar worldviews, similar situations, similar length of, you know, relationship before it ended, for example, you know, similar cultural background, the more similar somebody is to you, the more similar their experience is, the more likely it is that what worked for you also works for them. And so you can offer some advice and suggestions from a position of knowing whether you know that from your own experience or you know it from having gathered expertise and studied things at depth, talked to a lot of people about it. So I'm not going to knock the more directive style of coaching from own experiences or from knowledge. Uh, facilitative coaching is different. You don't necessarily mm. have to have gone through any of this to hold space for someone and allow them to figure it out. Um, so it's different ways of working, but when you do work in that directive way, you need to make sure that you choose your clients very carefully and it's very limited. And in reality, coaches do uh, make parallels to other people's experiences that may or may not be there. Yeah. No, I, I do think there is value in that connection because it's like, oh, so sure. you've gone through the same thing. So 
but I think the the problem is right because I I've been, I was in that space a lot. The problem is when actually the, that person doesn't doesn't realize like oh okay this person is a great story, and this is by the way how a lot of times coaches are like you just need to market your story and you will have a list of clients, right? Well, that that's that's nice, but it actually can damage people, right? Yeah. But if if that person knows, like, well, this person doesn't have any qualifications whatsoever to help me, but they just have that story. Well, okay, it'll be nice. Maybe just pay them a little bit to sit with them, right? So while I think there's value in it, I think personally that you know, and and this is of course a challenge in the industry. Like, it's not regulated. The challenge is, you know. Those clients usually don't get great results. Those coaches usually don't get a lot of renewals or referrals. And and then they're wondering like what what is happening. I've had coaches like that as clients where they're like coming with questions and you can see there's just really basic questions around how to coach and actually how to hold space and what to do with in those situations. And this is one of the reasons I've changed my approach as well. It's like, hey, look, you need to be qualified before I can help you grow the business because this is not good. And I think so, again, I'm not saying this is the only way, but personally, I would challenge people and say like, look, if you're really, if you really want to help people and you want success for your, for your work, for your business, think about like, you know, think about in 10 years, like what's going to make a difference. And I think at the core of that is how good you are at your craft, right? Not about how good your story is. Like, Oh, I've gone through, you know, this abuse and that and look now I'm here but how how you know how well equipped are you to really help people right even if you didn't have that story and you know, and I think the that, story is often more powerful than the craft yeah and it, no it, it, I think it's important to share stories like we all have stories that can be very powerful but I think it's coming back to how good you are right and, and at that uh, that beats any marketing long term Long term, yes, but short term, unfortunately, not. Right, a powerful story gets people to connect with you a lot easier. And if you're then not totally crap, you get a lot of work. You know, I think in the long term you get more work if you're really good. But you know, it, we live in a very fast world. Um, but that that I think gets the conversation in a very different direction. Uh, Nikki, I, I wonder, I wonder what you think about this. Yeah, I've been. Um... Really, I think, yeah, you've both made some really interesting and valid points. I've just noticed, you know, I've got maybe a slightly different take just based on my own personal experience with a situation like that. I was, um, I both had a therapist and a coach at the time that my dad passed away unexpectedly. So I guess I'm kind of here kind of trying to reflect on how did both these processes support me during that time. Um, and I think... You know, my memory, I mean, fundamentally, I can see in that moment that they're, the way they were also approached by my therapist as opposed to my coach were were different. I did feel like in therapy, there was more of a space to delving into the feelings and, you know, in the, doing the kind of work that's typical of therapy. Whilst I feel like with my coach, what I really appreciated, you know, of course, we spoke about it as well, but maybe a bit more removed from like the more emotional side of it but it certainly came into it I did feel if at the end of the day that the coaching however helped me in a way better maybe not to process but to actually move move forward and to continue to move forward by giving me a little bit of like you know steps and actions and things to like you know keep moving in a direction and not stay maybe stuck in the pain and emotion and maybe that's a need that's particular to me to have that in a time when I'm grieving, but, um, so my experience w was with it, you know, both were really helpful. They just did different things. Um, and I think that's what they're supposed to do to some extent, not that there isn't some overlap, but yeah, I think, you know, if we're looking at, you know, specifically a grief coach, even though that's not written into the question originally, yeah, then I, I kind of see the points that you're making more, but anyway, that was just to share a little bit of a different take on it. Yeah, that. Thank you so much. Um, sorry to go through that. Um, I what what that brings up for me is that it's so important if you do work around loss or grief of some sort that you have a good agreement in place, 
uh, particularly around limitations and boundaries. So I've taken on a client who has uh, fairly recently lost his wife. And uh, I certainly hesitated a lot, <laughs> you know. Um, what was important, like really, first of all, listening, meeting that person. I don't want to make an immediate decision of like, no, definitely not. Because there's a person that's reaching out um, for help and support. And I don't just immediately want to close that door. I want to make sure that they're okay and they get the service and the help and the support that they need. Right. So I think quite often what will probably happen when people approach you, uh, having lost someone that they loved, um, is that uh, you can help them find the right kind of support. You know? So this person struck me as really robust, very resilient, um, willing to process this, but like very rational. And so I was sitting with this experience and I'm like, well, and I told him all of this, by the way, it's very transparent around it. It could be that session three, the floodgates open, you know, and all the emotion breaks through. And at that point, I, I may not be the person who's willing or able to hold that kind of space. Because once somebody starts crying, they might not stop for weeks. And they might just sit there and cry every session for a while. Mm. That I, that's not the work that I'm doing. I possibly could just as a human being hold space for that person who's grieving. I, I don't want to. And I think I don't understand the complexity of grief to a point where I feel I'm a qualified person to hold that space. But how they presented on the day made me very confident that if that were maybe not to happen, if they're just that kind of person that processes grief differently, you know, this was not sudden, this was not unexpected. You know, this was uh, an illness that was there for a long time. They'd already processed a lot of the realities around that. You know, their worldview, their belief system helped them to, well, that's that's just how life goes sometimes. And it's sad. I don't have regrets. You know, I, I think I felt I could really help that person, possibly even more than a therapist who is like just bringing out the grief and you know, bringing out the emotions. I don't want to make that person cry, but I appreciate that there's a, as a possibility that we'll reach a stage, maybe soon, maybe never, maybe very quickly, where it just is no longer the kind of work that I do. And I just was transparent around that. And we were working in partnership and he appreciated that there may be a time when we stop working and maybe it's better to see somebody weekly who who's trained at holding space at emotional depth. Um, and then we agreed to give it a shot. So, but I certainly <laughs> took that to my supervisor. I certainly reflected on that. Uh, I was, if anything, a bit too careful even, you know, I must have brought it up three times to really make sure that this person heard that there may be a time when this is no longer working. So that at that point, it doesn't feel like I'm abandoning them, but that I care so much that I'm willing to not work with them. You know, and I think that's very, very important. If somebody's floodgates open and there is a lot of emotion, the worst thing that can happen is that the coach all of a sudden is like, oh my God, this is not me. No, I cannot longer work with you. You know, we need to be, that's why I need to be very, very sensitive, I think, with, with bereavement and grief. Yeah. Yeah. I, I coached someone last year. Um, just, yeah, I think a few months after. She lost her husband, and I think it's very tough. I, I I think you know I think it's uh I think it's useful if that person like you know Nikki like you had support. You know, if they have if they have a therapist on the side, if they have some support on the side, and I think you know personally I haven't done a lot of research into this, but I think there's there's also psychological benefit right in terms of moving forward, and I think that's part of why coaching can be really useful. But again, personally, I think it's when it's done, when you have someone else on the side, you know, whether it's whether it's a therapist um, or not, people on the side that really support you to that process. And I know that in in Islam, for example, it's it's encouraged to move on after three days. So you, for example, you lose someone. It's only I think when you lose your wife or your husband, you can take time out for four months, 
but actually in general it's recommended after three days and i was always curious about it like why is wow. it like that but after three days you have to go back to work huh right what? and i actually um so but i can see that there's by the way that doesn't mean that you you have to act like nothing happened like we are we know there's there's stories of you know where people you know you can be they're sad for a year or they're processing it but after you know after a few so with with a partner after four months with for example a parent after three days but i can also see the psychological benefit of that because moving on you know can help you build resilience and i think one of the things that i notice in in my limited experience coaching is the, the that person you know i mean for time to time it was tough like where you said this happened like really had to hold space because a lot of emotions came up should for example go off camera for a few minutes but then you know it's those little steps taking taking little steps forward right and for me again i had to be very mindful and check in from time to time how does this feel or this time where she felt like, oh, I'm, I'm really feeling overwhelmed. Like, can we take it a, a lot more slower? Right. But I think, you know, one of the things that makes coaching so useful is perspective. Right. And, and so I, I can see a lot of benefits of coaching and I can potentially see, you know, again, this is not knocking people that call themselves grief or bereavement coaches, but I think sometimes I think a great, a good coach with no experience in that area potentially be of more benefit than someone that just has gone through it, but doesn't have the coaching skills. So ideally I would say like, you know, come in the middle, right? If you have that experience, you want to help more people like that, build those coaching skills, right? And, and potentially maybe explore, do more research in terms of like, what is, what is really the, how can I support my client even more? You know, I've gone through some big, um, one last thing is like I've gone through some big challenges this year. And what I've found really useful is having my own therapist while I have, you know, my business coach, while I have coaches that support me on the mindset part, on growing, you know, moving forward to life. But at the same time I have a therapist where I can just go in a very different direction and and in that has been really challenging for me. In the past, I would just kind of switch a button and say, "Let's switch those feelings off. <laughs> let's just go. <laughs> let's let's just go perform, right?" But then I think that that's the most challenging part is just like it's expressing those feelings, and and I know that most coaches cannot deal with that part, right? The way the way the therapist does is like they they're trained, they have dozens of years of training, and they understand what to do in those moments. Yeah, and for some it's a challenge to uh, let the emotions out. For uh, others, it's a challenge to switch the emotions off. Right. So I think mm-hmm. it's so context specific. People are so different. Uh, you know, somebody might lose their dad, and it just yeah, it was it made sense. They were old age, and this is just how life goes. And then after three days, they appreciate going back to work. And people are worried that they're back at work, but it's actually really helpful for them to move forward. You know, and others. I think would be unable to do anything productive at work after three days because they really have a lot of processing to do if it, for example, happened very suddenly. Um, you know, so I think developing that sensitivity to who's this person and what do they need right now? And then know what you can and what you cannot do and be very clear around when to stop you know, and when our work stops and better work for you begins. Having a good referral network helps. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's so context specific because it's not one experience. Uh, grief can be so different for so many people. Nikki, any, any oh, well, <laughs> that came out wrong. <laughs> I wanted to say any last words, but that sounds a bit, <laughs> sounds a bit morbid in words. this context. <laughs> um, no, I mean, what, what I, what I'm, what I'm really curious about, I guess, is, is um, you know, nowadays, I think more and more you also see people who are trained therapists and trained coaches. And, I, you know, that suddenly I was like, oh, how would those two work together in that space? So that that's where my head's at. But I found a, a really interesting conversation. Yeah. yeah, I think if people, if coaches have, are also trained therapists, 
fantastic. They can go across a huge spectrum of human experience. Uh, if a therapist doesn't have any coaching skills, they can probably do some coaching intuitively, look forward, help to set goals. And I know many therapists do. Um, but if you're a coach and you're not a trained therapist, it's still a spectrum. I know some coaches who are not trained therapists, but they just have this way of being with people that holds such a healing space. Um, and it's debatable whether those people should be allowed, you know, in speech marks, um, should be should it be regulated? Because I know there's people doing grief work who are who don't have a license to do grief work, and they do very effective grief work, very powerful grief work. So I'm as a challenger of authority very often, I, I'm in two minds whether we do need a lot more regulation to protect people to work with coaches who do who don't are not trained and they're not very good at it, and they're just making assumptions based on their own experience of loss. And that can potentially be very harmful. And I'd you know, encourage coaches to talk to other coaches who do that work and kind of see where they're at, ask, ask some questions and see if they can help other people to reflect on how they work, whether some of that might be at play. But also I don't want to forbid anybody to work with grief and loss just because they don't have the proper license because then this, there's a lot of gatekeeping and it takes a lot of money and investment on the only a very small percentage of the population are going to be able to train as a therapist and can afford it, you know? Uh, and so, yeah, I'm in two minds about that, but I hope we could uh, raise enough questions for coaches to consider or maybe reconsider um, doing that work. Cool. I think we have to stop here. We're out of time. Thank you so much. Um, Again, if I have another handful of conversations about this topic based on this conversation, uh, I'd love to. So uh, if you're a bereavement coach feeling deeply offended, I'd love to hear why. Um, if you have experiences around having worked with grief coaches or you found a good way to make this work, you have any anything to add that we might have not covered, I'm sure there's many angles that we haven't covered. Uh, please be part of the conversation. I'd love to hear from you. today. I appreciate your commitment to learning and growing as a coach. Just a few things before you go. First of all, we're doing this for you, so if there's anything you'd like us to talk about, do send us a question. Secondly, we're not doing this for profit, so we rely on your support to help us reach as many coaches as we can. So if you can send this episode to a friend or tell a fellow coach uh, about what we're doing here, maybe you can subscribe or leave us a review or even support us on Patreon. Um, that would be amazing. And lastly, you can find us across all major platforms. So uh, whether you like to watch or you like to listen or you like to download episodes and listen to it uh, in your car while you're driving through somewhere with no internet, uh, you can do so too. Um, and that's it from us. Thank you and I hope to see you next time.